Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to cover 1 Samuel, starting at chapter 4, going all the way to chapter 31. And this whole book is the story of Israel's first king, King Saul. And we're going to learn a lot from King Saul. We're going to learn a lot from David. There's some marvelous episodes here that are very applicable. And it would be nice if we could renumber these books. First Samuel should be called First Kings. Second Samuel is really the second king. And then First Kings is really the story of the third king and then beyond. So we're just going to do a little bit of the history before we actually get to their request for a king. The irony here is... In the Old Testament, they're going to go from a system of judges. Not really, but at least that's what they called it. They're going to go from a system of judges to a monarchy. And in the Book of Mormon, we're going to come out of a monarchy because it's not working and go into a system of judges. So kind of an interesting juxtaposition there. But let's do a little bit of the history up until their call for a king. Right. So if you go to chapter 4, 1 Samuel, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was in Shiloh. That's in verse 3 and 4. And Shiloh was where the sanctuary is going to be, the tabernacle. And it's at this point when the Philistines are going to come and battle Israel, and they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to, we think, destroy the tabernacle. And then we read that Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are slain. That's all happening in this chapter. If you look in verse 17, it says, The messenger answered and said, Israel is fled. And then later in the verse, it says, Hophni and Phinehas are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And so we think at this point the tabernacle may have been destroyed, but for sure the Philistines take the ark. Now, the Philistines, briefly... They're going to be called the Sea Peoples. We think that they come from the Mediterranean, and there's a lot of ink spilled on this as far as which part of the Mediterranean do they come from. Are they Greeks? Are they coming from Crete? I'm not going to settle that, but just know that the Philistines are people that are going to come from the West in the Mediterranean, and they're going to settle down there in the valley in what a lot of scholars are going to call the Pentopolis. It's five cities that they settle, and one of them is Gath, and another one is Gaza, and in these five cities, they're going to do raiding parties where they come up and they raid the Israelites, and there's going to be tension between the Philistines and between the Israelites. And Bryce and I kind of talked about the Philistines a little bit when we talked about Samson. Samson goes, remember, he's an Israelite. He goes down to the Philistines and spends some time with them, and that tension exists at the end of the book of Judges. So that's a little bit about who they are. We know a little bit more about them and that they're coming from that region. Based, a lot of this is based on pottery. We can look at their pottery and those kinds of things and and we can tell the time period they got there, what they're doing. So they establish dominance over the Israelites in chapter 4. And the loss of the Ark of the Covenant is a symbol that God is not with Israel because he has promised to strengthen them and protect them. But if they don't keep their covenants, he does not bless. Remember that Abrahamic covenant? If you live up to the promises, if you live up to the covenant, he blesses and preserves you. So the symbol of the Philistines taking the Ark is a symbol that this is a real low point in Israel, that they are not following the Lord and they are not keeping that covenant. Absolutely. In fact, if you look in verse 18, Eli, when he hears the news, he dies. And the author of 1 Samuel says at the end of verse 18 that he judged Israel for 40 years. So now we've lost the judge. Remember, we're kind of carrying over from the judges and the judge is dead. And the the idea to me seems to be that 1 Samuel is going to say, well, guess who's going to judge? It's going to be Samuel. Samuel's going to rise up because the sons of Eli, they've been bad. They're dead. The ark's taken. So then we get to chapter 5. And chapter 5 is the story of the Philistines setting up the ark of the covenant in their temple to their God. Total mockery here. They're totally mocking Israel and Israel's God. They're basically saying our God is stronger than your God. Right. And they, they set it up to this God named Dagon, which is a half man, half fish type character. And he's this God that they have this image in their temple. A lot of the ancient cultures would have an image to their God. And the image kind of represented this way to channel the God's power. And so they set it up 
uh, the ark. And then like Bryce says, it's a mockery. And so their God actually falls down to the ground of verse four. This God, Dagon, falls down and breaks in pieces. And then the Philistines are smitten with what the text is going to call emeralds in their secret parts. And we get into the weeds on this in the show notes. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. But what we think this is are tumors caused by the bubonic plague. That's what we think is going on. And so this chapter is about the Philistines kind of arguing, do we keep the ark? Do we get rid of it? They, they sent it to one of the cities in the Pentapolis. Ekron is what it's called in 1 Samuel 5.10. And they're smitten again. And they're like, well, we've gotten rid of it. We sent it to this city. That's not working. I know. Let's send it back to Israel. And that's kind of chapter six. They decide to send it back to Israel. And they do. And they send it back with these five golden mice and five golden emeralds. And a lot of scholars think the reason why they're sending mice with the emeralds or these images of tumors is because they think perhaps the mice are what is spreading this. We don't really know what is going on with those mice, but we think that's what it is, that they've made the connection that the mice are spreading this. And so they send it back to the Israelites. They're tired of it. Kind of like when Jonah is running away from his assignment and the Lord is causing the really bad storm on the sea and they realize, oh, it's you. And so they toss him overboard. And so the Philistines are saying, hey, we took this and the God of the Israelites is cursing us. Let's give it back. You know, Bryce, it reminds me of what Spielberg did with the Ark. What's the name of that movie? Raiders Raiders of the the Lost Lost Ark. Yeah. When the Nazis get a hold of it and everything bad happens to the Nazis. And it's, I, I see Spielberg reading First Samuel and going, this would make for a great movie. Yeah. I think the idea here is the Lord needs to send to Israel that you've lost my presence. You've lost me being with you and protecting you because you're not living appropriately. But his message to the Philistines is, I won't be mocked. Right. You do not mock the Lord God even though I need to send the message to the Israelites that you've lost my presence. And so we kind of see a lot of that going on here. So they send it back and they take it to the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite. And verse 19 of 1 Samuel 6 says, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and 10 men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God and to whom shall he go up from us? Now, I think what's going on in these verses is the author is trying to establish the idea of authority. Don't look into the ark unless you are authorized to do so. I think that's the message, but this can be read lots of different ways. Clearly, Steven Spielberg used it in the movie, right? Raiders Lost Ark. We have Indy and Marion, and they're tied to the pole. And and remember, Indiana Jones says, don't look at it, Marion, and then they're preserved and the Nazis are killed. I think that's what Steven's doing. He's taking the Bible and he's making a film out of it. However you read verse 19 and 20, it seems like the author is trying to say, only those authorized can look. And I think part of it is... Whoever's writing this or whoever's redacting this, whoever's kind of got the pen in their hand is saying, God has not lost his ability to save. He is the mighty being that led Israel out of Egypt. God is still capable of mighty things, even when Israel does not necessarily deserve those mighty things because of how they're behaving. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so after they established the ark, not in Shiloh, but in kirjath Jerem, Samuel is going to exhort the Israelites to be faithful. He's going to offer a burnt offering, and the Israelites are going to attack the Philistines. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And then also, Samuel is going to judge Israel, and he's building an altar to the Lord in Ramah. That's in verses 15 and 17. The idea here is they're reacting to what they should have done that would have prevented the problem in the first place. So it's kind of like if you've ever been in an accident that was worse because you weren't wearing your seatbelt, and then from then on, you make sure you wear your seatbelt as if to say, this would have saved me had I done this before the accident. That's kind of what they're doing. They recognize that it was their lack of living the covenant that caused the loss of the ark. So now they're just strengthening themselves to say, let's not do that again. Let's make sure we are faithful and we keep the covenant and that we won't lose the ark. If we had done this before, we wouldn't have lost the ark in the first place. But what's happening here is Samuel is really rising into his role as prophet to Israel. Yeah. This is setting up Samuel as a prophet 
And as a great judge, he's going to give some really good prophetic direction to the Israelites, warning them, because this is the chapter, chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, where the Israelites are going to say, we want a king. Now, I think part of it is because of the first five verses of chapter 8. The sons of Samuel are walking in the same path that Eli's sons walked in. And it seems like the author of Samuel is trying to communicate this idea that because the person who should rise up and be a leader isn't, we've got a problem. We've got a power vacuum. And so the Israelites come to Samuel and say, we want to have a king. And the problem with that isn't that they want to have a king. We've read in the Book of Mormon that if you could have righteous kings, kings would be a great form of government. But because you can't always have a righteous king, that's why we shouldn't have kings. However, the real problem here is the reason why they want a king. And this is worth pausing a little bit and saying this applies so many ways to our lives. And this is the beginning of the downfall of Israel. This is kind of the turning point where we're going to see a major struggle. We will not see the glory days of Abraham, or we won't see Jacob, or we won't see Joseph as he rose to power in Israel. This is kind of the switch point that leads Israel to destruction. The northern We're going to see a split in Israel, then the northern tribes are going to be taken captive, and then a hundred years later, the southern tribes will be taken captive. And I wonder if the trigger point is right here, when they say, we want to have a king. Now, that's not the problem that they want to have a king. It's what they say after that. The end of verse 5 is the problem. We want to have a king to judge us like all the nations. We want to be like everyone else. Now, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to take you back to the Abrahamic covenant, and the general failure of the Old Testament is to not live up to that Abrahamic covenant. You remember, we talked about why Abraham was placed right in the middle of the world with so many empires all around him. And as long as Abraham is influencing the world, it brings blessings and prosperity like Joseph in Egypt. Joseph went in there and made the Lord's name known. He influenced Egypt and he rose in power. Daniel's going to do the same thing in Babylon. As long as Israel is influencing the world, they are blessed and protected and preserved and the God of Israel is with them. When we are more influenced by the world than we influence the world, we lose that protective power of the Lord. His covenant to save us is tied to our covenant to make his name known to the world. So as we fail to live up to that covenant, we fail to qualify for his protective blessings. And here is where it begins, because they say, we want to have a king to judge us like all the nations. And this really is going to lead to Israel's ultimate destruction. So the Lord's going to refuse. We'll get to that. We'll come back to this in just a minute. But the Lord's going to say, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Tell them all the things that kings are going to do. And he does. And then after warning them, they say, we don't care. In verse 19 and 20, nay, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. This is failure of the Abrahamic covenant. So now we're going to watch Israel really struggle. Now, to the degree that they are faithful to God, you're going to have moments of glory. But to the degree that they want to be like everyone else, they are not being blessed and protected by the Lord. So there's a great message from the Old Testament. We have to be different from the world. Bryce, I really like how you draw out the very last bit in verse 5, because the authors after the exile are going to say, we lost the temple because our kings were bad. But yet there's all these passages that talk about the anointed one. The word for the anointed one in the Greek, Christos, is where we get Christ, or Mashiach with Messiah. There's this idea in the Old Testament of the cosmic Messiah that's going to make everything right. And kingship is so fundamental to the Bible because the ideal king, this perfect Messiah that's going to fix things, 
is woven like a golden thread through the whole Old Testament. We'll see some of these, especially in Isaiah. And we'll see this when we talk about Nathan's prophetic promise to David. King David gets this beautiful promise about his throne. And to me, this is all tied to Jesus. Jesus is the cosmic king. So kings are awesome, especially when we talk about Jesus. Yeah, and I remind you of what King Mosiah said. It's worth a repeat again. He said, If it were possible that you could have just men to be your kings, who would establish the laws of God and judge this people according to his commandments, yea, if you could have men for your kings who would do even as my father Benjamin did for this people, I say unto you, if this could always be the case, then it would be expedient that you should always have kings to rule over you. It sure suggests that the problem isn't having a king in general. It's the not living the covenant. It's the wanting to be like everyone else that seems to be the problem. I think that's it. I think that's dead on. The list, I want to just briefly hit the list here. If you look in 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18, the the warning that Samuel gives is, if you guys choose a king, he's going to take your sons. He's going to make your children work his ground. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your fields. He's going to take, quote, a tenth of your seed and your vineyards, and your sheep, and your livestock. And yet he gives this list. They say, no, we want to have a king, verse 19. Thomas Paine quotes this chapter when he writes Common Sense. And Thomas Paine is this American thinker that says, and he warns the Americans in 1776, he warns them and says, guys, we don't want to have this. And I really do think, Bryce, that the Bible did influence the founding of the United States of America. And frankly, the European nations eventually follow suit and say, we're getting rid of kings. We're going to have this government of the people, by the people. And I think some of the roots of those ideas are coming out of 1 Samuel 8. So it's good on a lot of levels. Yeah. So with that, we're going to get into the story of the Saul. choosing of Saul. We've got to get the very first king. So chapter 9, 10, 11 is kind of the establishment of Saul as king. And then the rest of the chapters is kind of the fall of Saul. Why was the kingdom taken from Saul? And in order to make that point, we've got to turn our attention to something that Joseph Smith wrote in Liberty Jail. And maybe as a church, we haven't fully given this as much attention as it deserves, and yet it sure is fundamental in the lesson of Saul, and that is the idea of unrighteous dominion. Joseph Smith nailed it in Liberty Jail in his letter. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. In other words, Joseph raises a major red flag, and that is be very careful when you receive authority, whether that's through a calling through a work position, a government official, or any time you receive authority over someone else. Parenthood gives us authority. The warning is any amount of authority you receive causes a natural desire within us to exercise unrighteous dominion. Now, the Lord identifies four major forms of unrighteous dominion that cause us to lose our authority. He says, amen to the authority of that man. And here are the four. I'm reading in section 121 from the letter that Joseph Smith wrote in Liberty Jail. Excerpts have been taken out and are put in section 121, 122, and 123. I'm reading from section 121. Back in 34, he starts with, many are called, but few are chosen. And then he says in verse 37, that they may be conferred upon us. And I'm going to extend that to all forms of authority, that they may be conferred upon us, it is true. But if we make four mistakes, jumping down to the end of verse 37, amen to the priesthood or the authority of that person. And so I raise the warning voice to parents, to bishops and young women's leaders and young men's leaders, to bosses, to elected officials. If you do these four things, amen to the authority of that person. Number one on our list in verse 37 is to cover our sins. Now, we could spend a lot of time on that, but long story short, I think what the Lord is saying is you are going to make mistakes. All leaders make mistakes. It's the human nature inside you. Now, do you blame your mistake on other people? Do you hide your mistakes? Is your attitude that someone else made the mistake and not you? That's form number one. 
you cover your sins. Form number two is you use your authority to gratify your pride. I'm better because I have authority. Sometimes that takes the form of because I have a little authority, I assume I have all authority or a lot of authority. Number three on our list is that you exercise vain ambition, meaning it's your way. It's your idea. Because you're in charge, everyone has to do it your way. What's best for you is vain ambition. And then the last one is when we try to exercise control or compulsion or dominion in any form. I know there's many others, but those are the four that the Lord identifies. Covering our sins— gratifying our pride, gratifying our vain ambition, or exercising control, dominion, or compulsion. So that being said, let's learn the lesson from King Saul. If we could be sitting in a classroom, this would be better, because I would have one whiteboard that says, Saul before he got authority. And then I'd have another board that says, Saul after he receives authority. So let me make a case for why Saul was a good choice. Why was the very first king of Israel Saul? So we start the story of Saul in chapter 9, that there was a man among the Benjamites. Now that's important. Saul is a Benjaminite, which means he's not a Levite. He does not hold an office in the priesthood. Benjamin does not hold offices in the priesthood. Levi does. So he's a Benjaminite. Verse 2 Saul was his name, and first thing I would list on the board of why choose Saul, it says there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. That's a great choice to be a king. There wasn't a goodlier person. And then we get a big long story about Saul going out to find his dad's donkeys. And one thing that we learn along the way is verse 5 There comes a point in the search for the donkeys that Saul says to his companion, we got to go home. My father's going to worry about us. He's going to stop worrying about the donkeys and worry more about us. In other words, Saul was concerned about his father's worrying. This raises images of the stripling warriors, right? Where they say, Our parents knew. They cared more about the liberty of their fathers than they did about their own lives. Saul was that kind of person. Goodly, cared about his parents. And another one during the search for the donkeys, they get to where Samuel the prophet is. And Saul says, hey, there's a prophet in this city. Everything he says will come to pass. He refers to him as the seer. Let's go find the seer. Now, tell me what that teaches you about Saul. Let's go find the seer, and he'll tell us where the donkeys are. That's our third attribute of Saul, respect for the office of seer. And then this whole interchange between Samuel and Saul happens, and Samuel basically says, hey, you're going to be Israel's first king. You're the man that the Lord is telling me that is chosen to be the king. Now watch Saul's reaction. I'm still in chapter 9, verse 21. Saul answered and said, am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribes of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Now that's the kind of person you want to be your king. That is a humble man, cares about others, respect for authority, priesthood authority, especially a goodly person. So in chapter 10, starting in verse 7, 8, 9, 10, Saul is sent to the company of prophets. In verse 10, when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And they were so surprised because they say in verse 11, is Saul also among the prophets? So another reason to call this man to be the king is God is with him. He can hold company with prophets who he clearly respects. Now, just a couple other interesting tidbits about Saul. He's had all these interchanges with Samuel and with other prophets. It's become clear to him that many people think he's going to be the king. When someone says something really good about you, don't you run home and tell your mom what they said about you? 
So in verse 16, Saul goes home. And it says this marvelous sentence at the end of verse 16, but of the matter of the kingdom, wherefore Samuel spake, he told him not. He didn't even mention anything about being selected as the king. You know, Bryce, have you ever had that experience where you're talking to someone, you meet them, you have this conversation, or maybe you've known them for a period of time, and then way later you find out this amazing thing about them and they never mentioned they it They never you. mentioned it. I remember reading someone like that, and it was said later of that person, it, it struck me that it says his greatness was surpassed only by his humility. And it was really a tremendous attribute of that person. And that's kind of what we see here in Saul. He doesn't even tell his family about what Samuel has said about the kingdom. And then when he's gathered to be anointed and announced that he's going to be the king, in verse 21 of chapter 10, when they sought for him, they couldn't find him. Wouldn't he be front and center saying, here am I with all the pomp and all the circumstances? How do kings typically act on coronation day? And Saul is not to be found. And the Lord tells them why in verse 22, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And then this beautiful phrase, this beautiful tribute in verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And they cried out, God save the king. Now, unfortunately, all of that is about to change because Saul gets a little authority. But my point is, they chose the right person. They cho chose the right quality of a person. I think That's, we could say the Lord gave him the best guy they could, he could possibly give him, right? Yep. But now we're going to watch the downfall of Saul. He's going to do all four of those things the Lord said you shouldn't do. So in the next chapter, in chapter 11, Saul defeats Israel's enemy, the Ammonites, and his kingship is renewed again at Gilgal. So his kingship is initiated in the 10th chapter, verse 17 in Mizpeh, and we think that's where the sanctuary is. We know that Shiloh is wrecked. Then in chapter 10, verse 17, we think the, the tabernacle is rebuilt, we think, at Mizpeh. But then at chapter 11, verse 14, we read that his kingship is renewed at Gilgal. And they come and they probably have a ceremony there. And if you remember when we talked about Gilgal, that's that word that can mean circle. So there's some provocative things to look at when it comes to that, the idea of initiating kingship and renewing kingship. So then... In the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel, we have a bunch of if not statements. If you guys do this, this will happen. But if you don't, this will happen. And this is where Samuel really encourages the Israelites to fly straight. And he says things like, hey, the Lord has delivered you. And if you guys do right, you're going to be delivered. But if you don't, these bad things will happen. And he says it over and over again in different ways. And that's the message. Don't forsake the Lord. But if you do... It's not going to work out. So the beginning of the downfall of Saul is going to take place in the 13th chapter. And this is where Saul, according to the text, is going to authorize an offering that he's not authorized to do so. As we've heard Bryce mention that Saul is from Benjamin. And so him not being a Levite could be connected to this. And the message that he's given that's important, that is relevant to chapter 13, is all the way back in chapter 10 of 1 Samuel. And this is where Samuel gives instruction to Saul, and he says, Go before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days I want you to wait. Wait till I come, and then I'll show you what to do. That verse, verse 8, is the pretext to everything we're going to talk about in chapter 13. So now fast forward to 13, and this is Saul. He's where he's supposed to be, and Samuel hasn't showed up. And so Saul says, well, let's make an offering. Go to verse 8. He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel didn't show up. And so Saul says in verse 9, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings, and he, meaning Saul, offered the burnt offering. Now, where did he get that idea? I suppose that Saul assumed that because he had a little authority, he had all authority. 
Now, we've tried to highlight throughout the Old Testament, one of the ways we offend the Lord the most is when we do something without the authority to do it, when we act in the Lord's name and we don't have the authority to do it. And here Saul, who's the king, offers a priesthood ordinance without priesthood authority. And I think the assumption was, hey, I'm the king. I don't know if you've ever watched someone who has a church calling overstep that authority and begin to think, well, because I'm this, I'm going to tell you what to do, even though that's not in my stewardship. It's that same idea. It's that gratification of our pride that because I have a little authority, I assume I have more authority than I do. And here Saul offers a burnt offering. Bryce, as a historical side note, how many times in European history do we have this conflict between the so-called priesthood authority and the kings, and we have these stories of kings saying, no, I'm going to tell you what to do, and then we have Pope saying to the king, no, I'm in charge. And so this isn't something that's just unique to the biblical story. This is This is indicative of human history. Like the Bible's wrestling with this idea of who has authority. And to act when you don't have authority is where we say amen to the priesthood of the authority of that man. And so it's about to get worse. As soon as, verse 10, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, guess who shows up? His timing was absolutely perfect. Samuel shows up just as the offering is over and says in verse 11, what have you done? Now, does Saul say, oh my goodness, I am so sorry, I, I overstepped. My pride got to me. That's not how he responds. Remember, he's made a mistake. And do you remember the number one thing the Lord mentioned on our list of mistakes? When you make a mistake, you don't cover it. So watch what Saul does. He says, because I saw the people were scattered from me, and you didn't come, Samuel, this is really your fault. Because thou camest not within the days appointed, that the Philistines gathered themselves. And then he says in verse 12, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon us to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. I think that's the very definition of, quote, covering your sins. It's your fault. It's not mine. The lesson I think everyone needs to hear is don't let that little amount of authority go to your head and you do the same thing to other people. It's when the parent says to the child after the parent has made a mistake, oh, it's really your fault. You're the reason I made the mistake. Or where the boss makes a mistake and blames it on the employees. It's that natural tendency to cover our sins. Now, maybe in another kingdom, somewhere else, things would be different, but this is Israel, and the king of Israel is a symbol of Christ, and we just can't have that, Saul. The goodliest person that there ever was is now offering sacrifices without priesthood authority and blaming other people for doing so. So in verse 13, Samuel's going to say to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. Because you're not, Saul. You're not after the Lord's heart. Therefore, your kingdom won't continue. And so this is the beginning of trying to find a new king. We're going to get to David in a minute, but before we get to David, we're going to see Saul kind of devolve a little bit more. The rest of this chapter in chapter 13 talks about the Philistines and their greatness, possibly part of why he gave the sacrifice and was kind of worried is because the beginning of the chapter of chapter 13, verse two and five talks about their Israelites are completely outnumbered. I mean, huge numbers. 36,000 to 3,000, they're way outnumbered. And then the end of the chapter, after he gives the offering, talks about that the Israelites were vassals to the Philistines, and the Philistines had iron technology, and the Israelites had to go down to those five cities down there in the plain because there was, quote, no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. So the Israelites had to pay money to get their tools sharpened and those kinds of things. The Israelites are essentially in a tough position when it comes to technology, and now the Philistines are making them pay 
tribute. They're vassals to them. And so there's that tension. So we get to the 14th chapter, and this is the story of Jonathan, who is Saul's son. This is as good a chapter as David slaying Goliath. For some reason, this chapter kind of gets lost. But this story of Jonathan taking the garrison is just as powerful and as wonderful a story as David taking down Goliath. I see why it gets skipped because it's a little bit clunky. But if you read the 14th chapter, verses 6 through 15, we read that Jonathan, who is Saul's son, he climbs a precipice that's really difficult, and he surprises the Philistine outpost. And it says in the 15th verse that there was a trembling in the host and in the field and among all the people. And literally, it says in the Hebrew that the land trembled. And the reason why is because they have this surprise attack. The Israelites have surprised their enemy, and Saul's scouts see the Philistines scattering And because he doesn't want the Israelites to pause in their pursuit of them, we read in verse 24 of chapter 14 that he instructs his soldiers not to eat, saying, quote, cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening. So his, I see his motives. Let's go get these guys. The Philistines are being scattered. Jonathan's taken the outpost. Let's go finish them off. But he gives this cursing where he says, if anybody eats, let him be cursed. And the rest of the 14th chapter is this tension between Saul and his son, Jonathan. You see, Jonathan actually eats. According to the text, he hasn't heard the challenge. That's in verse 27, where it says, Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people. And so when Jonathan's charging and trying to catch the Philistines, he sees some honeycomb and he eats it and it gives him strength. And he should have eaten. That was the right thing to do. That was a good thing to do. The command to not eat was ridiculous, Saul. Talk about vain ambition. That's a major example of vain ambition because his army needs to eat. And Jonathan really doesn't do anything wrong other than violate kind of a an inappropriate command from the king who's trying to establish that I'm in charge and we're going to do things my way. That's how I see it, Mike. Yeah. Now, I will say this. I've been pulled over and given a ticket, and I said, I didn't know the speed limit was such and such. And the officer said, not my problem. Here's your ticket. And so there's that challenge. Like, is he at fault? Is he not? And the text really wants to show and lay out this tension between Saul and Jonathan. And so with that in mind, we get to some passages that are a little enigmatic. If you go to verse 35, it says that Saul built an altar unto the Lord. The same was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. So Saul's building an altar. We have altars all over the place through Samuel. Remember, we've got them in Shiloh and Ramah. We've got one here. We're going to see some other ones as well. But he builds it. Saul is then going to say in verse 41, the English and the King James is a little bit uh, sketchy. So I'm just going to read the English and the King James, and then I'll give you a couple other ways to read this. Therefore, Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken and the people escaped. Now, the Greek rendering of this verse, verse 41, is radically different than what we're reading in the English. This is what he's doing. We think he's taking the ephod and he's trying to take the Urim and Thummim and have the Lord explain who's at fault. Is it me, Saul asks, by giving this order? Is it Jonathan for breaking the order? Or is it the people? That, that's the big picture of what's going on with these verses. So after verse 41... Saul said, cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son, and Jonathan was taken. Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan tells him, hey, listen, I ate. But the end of the story is the people that are with Jonathan, that have fought with him. They say to Saul, don't punish him. Why? Because he's our guy. We would not have been victorious if it weren't for him. And the text seems to indicate that Saul was ready to execute his son. I mean, look at verse 45. The people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan. And I think, Bryce, we're falling right back in line with your message about unrighteous dominion. Saul is probably stamping his feet saying, hey, guys, I'm in charge. Listen to me. And Jonathan's over here saying, It's really hard for us to catch these Philistines on an empty stomach. I mean, good luck running a marathon without some food, right? So with that in mind, Jonathan's life is saved. And notice verse 52. There was a sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul, the editor writes. And when Saul saw any strong man or valiant man, he took him unto him. Now remember, 
That is reminding us of the warning in 1 Samuel 8, verse 11, where Samuel said, if you guys choose a king, he's going to take your sons. And so it's like the editor is trying to put little breadcrumbs in here saying, and thus we see. See, told you so. Yeah. Yep. Now that leads us to chapter 15, where Saul's going to do another unrighteous dominion-like act that's going to cause Samuel to say, you've lost the kingdom. He was given specific instructions. Now, I can't speak for the instructions. I know the Lord loves children, and the Lord doesn't slay children. He doesn't command children to be slain. So I don't know. I can't fully explain the command here. But Samuel comes in and says to Saul, hearken thou unto the voice of the Lord. Then he gives him a specific commandment. Verse 3, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. In other words, destroy everything. Bryce, I think we could kind of read this the way we we read Joshua. Yeah. There's lots of ways to read it. I don't think Bryce and I are going to tell you guys how to read it. Um, One of the ways I look at this is, welcome to the Bronze Age. Could it have been a Bronze Age editor and their approach to the text? Could it be, God is this cosmic warrior, and we're going to go in and we're going to harem everything? 15 kind of reads like Joshua, right? And this isn't the Lord's style. Again, we're not going to commentary on the command, but we are going to commentary on how Saul reacted to that. Now, as a foil to this, I want to remind you that probably what gave the stripling warriors in the Book of Mormon the miraculous preservation was, it says, they did obey with exactness the command of the prophet, and they are preserved miraculously. There's got to be a connection between those two. So here Saul was given a specific commandment, and he doesn't. Verse 8, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. So he does not obey the very specific command he was given by Samuel. He spared many things. And of course, guess who shows up just in time? The Lord says to Samuel in verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. Now, Joseph Smith changes that for those of you who don't like the Lord to say, It repenteth me. He softens that. But Samuel arose to meet Saul. Verse 13, Saul says unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, this is funny. You have permission to laugh at this. Saul says, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel says, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Oh, really, Saul, you obeyed the commandment? Why do I hear sheep and oxen? Now notice what Saul says. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. He blames the people. He blames the people. Again, this is the definition of covering your sins. I can just hear the sigh in Samuel's voice. And he says in verse 17, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And I just, there's so much in that statement. Before you got authority, Saul... You were little in your own sight. And this is where all of us listening to this needs to pause and say, has my authority caused me to forget who I was when I was called? When thou wast little in thine own sight. Then he reminds him, the Lord sent thee on a journey. He told you to destroy everyone. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? Now watch it again. Ready? Verse 20. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have obeyed and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Now notice what he says. But the people took of the spoil. It's always someone else's fault 
with unrighteous dominion. It's always someone else made the mistake instead of a leader saying, I blew it. Now, he's going to say that. Saul is going to say that, but it'll be too late. This is the moment for him to have said that. And his response was, hey, I did what's right, but the people took the spoil. Now, once again, Samuel is going to remind Saul that he's lost the kingdom. First, he teaches an eternal lesson. So here's the lesson. Samuel says in verse 22, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. That's a doctrine, and we could just we could talk about that for quite a bit, and that'd be a marvelous discussion to have this week with people you love. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Can I throw in one quick story that I heard from Boyd K. Packer? He once told a story about being the junior speaking companion to Spencer W. Kimball at a state conference. And at the prime meeting, President Kimball asked Elder Packer if he would speak and gave him a time limit, said, I want you to speak for 20 minutes. I don't remember the time. I think it was like 20 minutes. Now, Elder Packer thought to himself, these guys have traveled a long distance to hear from the prophet. They've come to hear from Spencer W. Kimball. I'm not going to take his time. So instead of speaking for 20 minutes, like President Kimball asked, he bore a brief testimony and then sat down. President Kimball scribbled out a note and handed it to him and then went to the podium. And that note said, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And that must have stung him. President Kimball had a reason he was asking Elder Packer to speak for 20 minutes. Those are the words we need to remember. To obey is better than to sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. So I think Saul is really penetrated to his heart, and he's repentant. He says in verse 24, I have sinned. I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And the words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I think this whole story would have been a lot better if he had had that spirit inside him, if he had been humble like that at first. But now, once again, the Lord's going to say, and end of verse 26, the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And then in verse 28, Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. In other words, amen to the authority of that man. So in the rest of chapter 15, look at verse 32. Then said Samuel, Bring hither to me Agag. Now Agag is the king of the Amalekites. And so remember, Agag was spared. So Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword has made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. So that's a really rough passage. There's got to be something that we don't know here, because this is not typical behavior of prophets. Well, this is not your typical Sunday school verse you want to read. And I get all the arguments people make about how the Old Testament kind of sounds violent, and I'm not going to settle those, but that's the portrayal of Samuel and how he takes on the Amalekites. And the end of chapter 15, it says, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. And Joseph Smith is going to give us a Joseph Smith translation on that, which says, the Lord rent the kingdom from Saul, whom he had made king over Israel. Now, the Hebrew of verse 35 is going to say, not that the Lord repented, but that the Lord was sorry, or he had pity, or he had deep feelings in his heart that he had made Saul king over Israel, meaning that the Lord is sad that this happened, that Saul is this kind of character. He's probably sitting there shaking his head saying, see, we've learned from sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men. Right. He's sad for what happened, not, ooh, I, the Lord, made a mistake. Clearly, the Lord knew what was going to happen in calling to Saul, and maybe that was the intended message. But the Lord is sad for the fall of Saul. And he leaves. Samuel leaves, and he never sees Saul again while Saul's alive. Now, in the first verse of chapter 16, Samuel is led by the Lord to find a new king. 
and he's led to a man named Jesse. Now, if you remember when we talked about Ruth, Jesse is a descendant of Ruth, and he lives in Bethlehem. Now, the Lord doesn't tell Samuel who the king's to be. He just says, go to find Jesse. Now, if you read verses 2 through 5, Samuel makes an offering to the Lord in Bethlehem. And for those of you keeping score at home, this puts us at three altars so far in the text. Shiloh, Bethel, and Bethlehem, not counting the altar that Saul builds in 1 Samuel 14.35. The reason why I'm drawing this out, the reason why I'm talking about this, is because if you remember way back in Deuteronomy of chapter 12, we have, according to the Deuteronomist historian in chapter 12, you can only have one place of sacrifice. So far, we're 16 chapters in 1 Samuel, and we have an authorized prophet, Samuel, and we have multiple altars in Israel. This is also indicated in archaeology. Archaeologists have gone into the land of Israel, and they found multiple holy sites that the Israelites used. And I think this is important for us to realize that although Deuteronomy 12 says there's only one place where the Lord shall choose to put his name, we have an authorized prophet right here building altars all over the place in the land. I think that's important, but it's not the main thing. The main thing of chapter 16 is the discovery of this son. This young man who is a son of Jesse, David is chosen based on the Lord choosing him, and he's not what you think he would be. He's not going to fit the expectations of a king as Saul did. This king is a young lad. Now, Samuel was nervous about Saul finding out, and so he says, look, just invite Jesse to the sacrifice. Have Jesse come to the sacrifice and say that you're sacrificing, and that's where you'll meet his sons. And then as soon as he's waiting for Jesse to come to the sacrifice, in comes Eliab, the oldest, and I'm guessing he looked like a king. He certainly seems to have been tall. He's commanding, as we will read in the story of Goliath. He looked like a king, and Samuel the prophet makes the mistake that so many of us make, and he renders a judgment based on how he looked, or maybe what he said, or how he acted. It is so human nature to render a judgment based on an outward appearance. And the Lord teaches one of the greatest lessons of the gospel we'll ever find in any book of Scripture— It's a lesson on how God judges. It's what I call celestial judgment. Someday, if we want to go where God is and be what God is, we have to learn to judge the way he judges. And this is one of the great lessons on how God judges. And he says to Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh on the heart. I think he's saying two things. And it's worth pausing and talking to your class, your family, having a discussion this week about these two issues. Number one, we need to stop judging people based on what we see, hear, smell, however they act. We need to stop jumping to assumptions based on the outward appearance. We need to judge better. The second discussion I think you need to have is we need to understand how God judges. He does not see the action. He sees the intent. And sometimes that changes the story dramatically. I think he can look on our sins and our transgressions and our wrongdoings with a whole lot more mercy because he understands what we were thinking and why we did that. And what was the inner desire that led to that behavior? God will be much more merciful to us because he understands the intent of my heart. And if we judged like that, two things would happen. We would be better judges of other people, but we would have greater confidence in our own judgment, knowing that that's how God judged. I may have done wrong, but I wanted to be good. Because what was in my heart is very different than what you saw me do. And I think those two lessons need to come out of this week's Come Follow Me. Those two discussions we need to have. Yeah. So David is chosen based on the Lord choosing him. And if you read verses 8 through 13 of chapter 16, he is chosen and he's anointed king. If you look in verse 13, it says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren 
And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, in the text, there's basically three ways David is chosen as king. We have this story, and then we have the story where he comforts Saul, and he plays the harp for him, and he kind of relieves Saul of his depression. That's the second story. And then the third story is where he slays Goliath. And at the conclusion of him slaying Goliath, we have these really puzzling verses. He kills Goliath, and then Saul says, who is this guy? And we think these are three different traditional strains that whoever put together and edited these texts saw these three strains or these three different textual traditions about David being chosen. And he said, you know what? I'm going to put them all in there. But this one is where he's anointed in a private service. And then we get to the end of chapter 16, where he plays music for King Saul. King Saul is distressed. And due to this distress, he calls for a musician to comfort him. And David is chosen and plays the harp. And this relieves his distress. And there are some Joseph Smith changes throughout the chapter because it talks about an evil spirit from the Lord that was upon Saul. And so Joseph corrects those ideas. And so that's the end of 16. And probably, I mean, I mean, if you were to talk to somebody on the street who's never read the Bible and you were to say, hey, do you know the story of David and Goliath? I think most Americans know the story. One of my favorite things to do as a seminary teacher is I would find those commercials. There's one that's a golf commercial where they have this golf ball and it shows, you know, David using a golf ball instead of a stone. He uses a golf ball and he takes out Goliath. The company's point is if you use our golf balls, you're going to hit the mark. And it's really humorous. The David and Goliath motif is used a lot in marketing. It has so many good spiritual lessons as well as lessons about who David was. So in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, we're back to this competition or this strife between the Philistines and the Israelites. And the Philistines have this individual who's from Gath. That's verse 4. Which is one of the five cities, right, Mike? That was one of the five. Yeah, that's one of the five cities. And it says that he's six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit is from your, for an adult male, from his elbow to the tip of his middle finger. Two cubits is three feet. Six is going to be nine. A span is going to be four or five inches. So the Masoretic text is putting him at over nine feet. Now, the Greek text is going to put him at four cubits. And so if you do four cubits in a span, that's going to put Goliath at six foot four. And Jerome, when he's putting this together and the other translators, when they're having to decide, okay, what are we going to do? A lot of these translators would read the Greek, they'd read the Hebrew, and then they have to make a decision. And the decision that the translators use for the King James Version is we're going to give you a nine foot tall Goliath. My take is I think he probably was more like six foot four. The tallest guy in history that we know of is this fellow who was 8 foot 11, and his name is Robert Wadlow. And so we put some things in the show notes about that. We also put some things in the show notes about the height of Goliath. My take is he's probably 6'4", but either way, he's still a tall guy. And then he has a bunch of really interesting armor on. It talks about a helmet of brass and a coat of mail that weighed 130 pounds. I'm just kind of translating the the measurements used here. Greaves of brass, a target of brass between his shoulders, and a spear of iron, it says. And then I translate the measurements here. It's 15 pounds. It's a 15-pound spear. Some scholars have argued that Goliath's gear demonstrates a later telling of the story with a 7th century author giving 7th century armor, essentially portraying him as a 7th century warrior wearing hoplite armor. In other words, this is a fabricated memory of the 7th century Deuteronomistic historian. Other scholars disagree, and they say while the text may have been edited during the Deuteronomist time in the 7th century, that Goliath's armor actually does fit in an ancient Near Eastern context. If you're one of those people that is interested in this, we link some stuff in the show notes for you to read. I haven't settled the argument. I certainly don't know, but I think it really is interesting. The author of 1 Samuel 17 wants you to know these specifics, and I think the purpose of why he's telling you this stuff is because, first of all, the coat, it's called a coat of mail in verse 5, but it really wasn't chain mail like we think of, but they were these overlapping like fish scales, bronze armor, and it was 130 pounds. The author is showing you these images because that was more than any human could ever possibly wear. And if you've ever done the shot put, good luck throwing a 15-pound spear. I mean, just go ahead and try that, even with something that's even lighter than that. Goliath is a big deal. If you look to verse 16, it says that the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 
40 days. He's also called the champion in the text. And the word actually isn't champion. The word in the Hebrew is the man in between. In other words, we have the Philistine army and we have the Israelite army, and Goliath is a man in between. He's a champion. And the reason why I like that idea of the man in between is because the real man in between is David. David is the man in between. And another way to read this story, this beautiful fight between Goliath, this massive giant, and this small shepherd, is Jesus is the man in between. If you read it like that, Jesus is the man betwixt or between you and Goliath. And he will fight your battles. Yeah, whatever challenge you face, he's the man in between. So good. I love that image of the man in between for champion. So one of the reasons the story is being so inflated is to make a point. Just like Jesus mentions a 10,000 talent debt, which was astronomical, to make a point about God paying that debt, the size of Goliath is exaggerated to make the point that sometimes we face large foes in our life. And I know this story is being told to establish David as king. This is putting David in his place. But you and I can apply this in so many ways. And one of those ways is how do you tackle a large foe? Goliath is a symbol of the unconquerable foe that we face. And so let me just point out a couple strategies that you could help someone you love who's facing a tough situation. Let's suppose you have a child who has an addiction and they're trying to break the addiction or some situation like that, that they need help conquering a foe. I want to point out six things that David does that can be applied to whatever foe we face. Number one, we find in verse 26, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? And I think here's the strategy. If you were to compare a nine-foot, nine-inch giant to the average warrior in Israel, Goliath seems enormous. And sometimes when we look at our problems compared to our ability to solve, the problem seems enormous. So the strategy is don't focus on how big the problem is compared to you. Instead, focus on how, how small the problem is compared to God. There's the key. You will gain a lot more confidence in conquering your foe if you see your foe and God's ability to defeat it rather than the foe and your ability to defeat it. Who you compare Goliath with will make all the difference in the world. And David compared Goliath to God, and that made Goliath seem very small. Number two, be prepared for the naysayers. Know that there are those who are going to say you can't do it. And this time it's Saul himself. In verse 33, Saul says to David, you can't do this. Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him. And he's going to give him all these reasons. Be prepared for the naysayers who say that you can't do it. Number three, David is drawing confidence in past successes. If you're worried that God will be with you in the conquering of Goliath, spend some time pondering all the times God has been with you. David says, look, I conquered a lion and a bear. I can conquer this guy. And the strategy there is brilliant. Why would I assume God won't be with me in this battle? He was with me in that one and the one before. It reminds me of the brethren encouraging us to write in our journal the answers to our prayers. As we reflect back on the answers to our prayers, it invites more revelation, and it also encourages us in our faith. It's back to what mean these stones. The stones mean that God has been with others, so he will be with you. But in this case, it's God has been with you in the past. Why would he abandon you now? So take courage in the moments where God has been with you in the past. It will give you confidence to face the Goliath because you beat a lion and a bear. Number four, Saul says, take my armor. Once Saul says, okay, you go, you go face him. 
Saul says, take my armor. And David says, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. In other words, fight the battle the Lord's way, your way, not necessarily the world's way. Now, I don't want to discredit all the tools that the world has for conquering an addiction. I think we should take them for what they're worth. But don't solely rely on the armor of the world. He's taking off the armor of an unproven system, and he's going to trust his system. Now, I don't want that to be taken out out of context, because I do believe that the Lord would require us to go to a doctor and not just trust that the Lord will heal my disease. So find in that a balance. Maybe the armor is beneficial, but don't be afraid to say, this isn't the armor I'm going to use to win this battle. He instead chooses five stones out of the brook and his sling. Now, when he faces off with Goliath, Goliath mocks him and says, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? In other words, this is ridiculous. There's no way this guy's going to defeat me. And David says in verse 45 and 46, what I would say is strategy number five. Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied this day, will the Lord deliver thee into mine hands, and I will smite thee and take thine head off. That, end of verse 46, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. If you conquer your problems with God's help, if you make God your partner through prayer and covenants, and as we'll see next week, through covenants in the temple, if you make God your partner, you'll succeed. And then I want to contrast two scriptures. Back in verse 24, when Goliath first shows up, the men of Israel fled from him. And yet David in verse 48 runs toward him. I find when I face a problem, it's easier to run away from the problem. Worry and stress are one of the ways we run away from our problem, but they don't get anything accomplished. Face the problem. Don't hide it and pretend it's going to go away. Run towards it. I hope one or all of those six suggestions will help you conquer the Goliaths of your life or help people you love conquer the Goliaths of theirs. Just really quickly, number one, compare your problem to the greatness of God, not to your ability to solve it. Number two, be prepared for the opposition that's going to come. The naysayers are going to try and tell you you can't do it, so just quit. Number three, gain confidence in past successes. Before you look at a big problem and assume you can't, look back at all the smaller problems you conquered and say to yourself, you can. Number four, use the right armor. Number five, make sure the Lord is with you. Even in overcoming an addiction, get God to be with you, and you're much more likely to conquer the problem. And then number six, run to the problem. And when David does all of those, that sling, that stone goes right into Goliath's forehead. He falls down, and then David chops off his head with his own sword. Don A. Jokes said this. He said, Countless young people have been inspired by this marvelous instruction in righteousness. At times, all of us must stand against those who mock and revile. Some of us sometime will face some earthly power as mighty as Goliath. When that happens, we should emulate the courage of David, who was mighty because he had faith, and he went forth in a righteous cause in the name of the Lord of hosts. President Hinckley said that there are Goliaths all around us, and he likened this story to the Goliaths of, quote, men and institutions that control attractive but evil things. And then he gives a list of those things. And we put this in the show notes if you're interested. Depending on who you teach, you may want to use some of these quotes. And I think that if there's anything in this whole book of First Samuel that the brethren have used in their teaching, this story would be on the top of that list. The end of the chapter is where we usually don't read this. 
But the end of the chapter, after he hits him in the forehead, that's verse 49, we read that Goliath fell to the earth, that David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in David's hand. He doesn't have a a sword. So what does he do? He runs, verse 51, takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. And then it says in verse 52 that the men of Israel and Judah arose and they shouted and they pursued the Philistines even into the valley, into the gates of Ekron. That's one of those cities in the Pentopolis, the five cities of the Philistines. And it says, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way. And David in verse 54 takes the head of Goliath and he brings it to Jerusalem and he put his armor in his tent. Now, there's a couple problems with verse 54, but I think this is also important. The problem with verse 54 is this. Jerusalem doesn't exist yet. David is going to purchase the threshing floor of Jebus, or Jebus as it's called in English. He's going to purchase the threshing floor there to where the temple can be built, and he's going to establish a city in this Jebusite city that's going to then be called Jerusalem. So it doesn't exist yet. So what we think is going on in verse 54 is a later editor is saying, okay, I'm going to tell you this story and that David's going to take the head of the Philistine and bring it to this place. Was it Jerusalem? I don't know. But the image, I think, the image of the head of Goliath and his armor and his sword are going to be part of the articles of kingship, and that through the course of history in the Israelite kings, that the sword of Goliath will be to the Israelites like the sword of Laban was to the Nephites, and that Goliath's armor is kind of the symbol that God was with us. Now, we kind of lose the armor in the narrative. The the armor isn't really mentioned again, but the sword of Goliath is, and it's just kind of parenthetically put in there. And my take on this is that the sword of Goliath is this beautiful symbol that's part of holiness to tell the Israelites, hey, you guys, I was with you. And so the rest of the chapter after that, after they take the armor and they take the sword and all those things, the rest of the chapter is Saul asking the question, who is this fella? I don't know who this fella is. And he says, inquire whose son this stripling is. And they come to him and say, hey, this is David, the son of Jesse. And so that's the end of that story. Now, in 18, David's kind of put in charge of the armies. And we read in 18 a couple of interesting things. Michal, or as the English says, Michael, that's Saul's daughter. She's going to love David. That's in the 20th verse. And Jonathan, Saul's son, he loves David. So David is well-beloved by the family of Saul. But in the course of him being in charge of the armies, he starts to beat the Philistines back, and Saul gets jealous. You see, David, after his victory over Goliath, is successful in all of his undertakings, and everyone loves him, including Michal and and Jonathan. He arouses the enmity of Saul, who schemes to get rid of him, but in his attempts, they all fail. You see, three times the narrative states that David is successful, and three times the narrative states that Saul fears David because the Lord is with him. That's in verses 12, 14, and 15, and 28, and 29. The narrative makes Saul completely transparent because it continually discloses his feelings and his motives. The big point of chapter 18 is Saul is so jealous of David. Now, David's to be king. And so Saul says, I'll let you marry my daughter. And the bride price, according to verse 25, is proof of death of a hundred Philistines. And it's pretty graphic the way it's described. And so Saul says, I'll let you marry my daughter if you bring me proof of death. Now, in the Book of Mormon, we read that the arms of the bad guys, right? Ammon cuts off the arms of the bad guys, and those arms are brought to the king. What's interesting is in Egypt, they would bring the hands of the enemies. They'd kill the enemies and cut off their hands, and they would present that to the king to say, look how glorious we've been. And so in this chapter... David goes and he defeats the Philistines. Verse 27 says that he doubles the bride price. He actually brings proof of death of 200 Philistines. And so the end of verse 27 is Saul gives him Michal, or Michael, his daughter to wife. But Bryce, I think he set him up. I think he wants David to actually die because he's jealous. Would you read it that way? Yep. 
I think chapter 18, for me in my personal life and in my teachings and my discussions, is one of the great lessons of the Old Testament. It is one I turn to frequently. It is bookmarked in my scriptures because it is a great lesson of human nature, and I think the Lord is shouting it out. So after David takes over the army and starts to gain success, and he starts to win battles— And then as he comes back to the city, the women begin to sing. Now notice in verse 7 what they sing. The women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now this is where human nature steps in and we start to compare ourselves to other people. Now notice what Saul does and think about how often you've done this. Verse 8. Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. I want to talk about that word but. We but ourselves all the time. Listen and tell me what is Saul doing with the word but. To David they have ascribed ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. We actually diminish our own accomplishments because someone else did good. This is natural behavior for all of us. As soon as someone's prettier than you are, you tear yourself down because she's pretty. As soon as someone else makes more money than you do, we tear ourselves down because they're successful. When we compare ourselves, we often end up on the losing end of that because we see their strength and we compare it to our weakness and we butt ourselves. We tear ourselves down by the comparison. And that is unfair to them and it's unfair to ourselves. That cannot be pleasing to the God of heaven who created you in such a brilliant way to make you unique among all of his creations. How often do we butt ourselves and tear ourselves down because someone else is successful? Now, that's exactly what Saul's going to do, and it's going to fester, and it's going to grow, and it's going to lead to him seeking David's life. Because as soon as he butts himself in battle, he's going to butt his value as king. And he's going to say at the very end of verse 8, what can he have more but the kingdom? If he's better than me in war, he's better than me in kingship, and he's going to take over the kingdom. And Saul eyes him from that day forward, and Saul will spend the rest of his life seeking David's death, exactly like Ahab and the whale. He will be obsessed at killing David for his own sake. That's what budding ourselves does. As soon as you butt yourself and you tear yourself down, it naturally leads to you tearing other people down in a way to lift yourself up, which is crazy. Heavenly Father can't be pleased when we do that. Let me give you the contrast. The Book of Mormon has the contrast, because if ever anyone could have butted himself, it was Alma. Do you remember when Alma and his four best friends were converted by an angel and then all five of them decided to serve missions? His four friends decided to go to the Lamanites. After they departed for their missions, do you remember when they meet up? Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni are coming back with their Lamanite converts. Thousands of Lamanites have converted to the gospel and they're bringing them up to Zarahemla to live. Alma is returning from Ammoniah, which was a complete disaster where women and children got burned and Alma was rejected. That's the setting. Alma is coming out of Ammoniah. Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni are coming up from the land of the Lamanites. If anyone could have butted himself, it was Alma. He could easily have said, Ammon has 10,000 converts, and I have but thousands. And he could have torn himself down because something really good happened to Ammon. Instead, 
Notice what Alma does. It starts with how we feel about ourselves and what God has done in our life. Turn with me to Alma chapter 29. Here's the contrasting chapter to 1 Samuel 18. He starts by saying, oh, that I were an, I wish I could be a better missionary. I wish I could shake the earth and people would know that the gospel is true. And then he says, no, I sin in my wish for I ought to be content. And then he gives this incredible verse in Alma chapter 29, verse nine. I know that which the Lord hath commanded me, or I think we could paraphrase and say, I know that which the Lord made me. I know what God did when he made me and I glory in it. I do not glory in myself, but I glory in that which the Lord made me. Sometimes when I teach this, people push back and say, I can't glory in myself because that's pride. And my point is, it's not pride when you glory in what God did when he made you. It is the recognition of God's greatness in your life, that God did something special when he made you. No, he didn't make you like other people but he did make something fantastic when he made you. If you have an Alma 29.9 moment where you say, I am enough, then you can have an Alma 29.14 moment where Alma says, I do not joy in my own success alone, but my joy is more full because of the success of my brethren. Rather than butting yourself and tearing yourself down because someone else did something good, their success makes you more joyful. I don't need to compare to you. I'm doing what God wants me to do. I glory in my creation, which allows me to glory in their creation. If Saul had said, hey, I am grateful that God has made me king, and I glory in that assignment, and David, you're a wonderful man, and you're going to be a wonderful king I hope you will remember Saul. I call this Saul disease. I hope you will remember Saul disease and the natural tendency to compare ourselves to other people and tear ourselves down because good things are happening in the life of other people. Don't butt yourself. Because Saul butts himself, he will spend the rest of his life hunting down David and trying to destroy David as a threat to his success. That's the rest of the chapters that aren't in Come, Follow Me. It's the sad story of Saul's jealousy causing him to hunt down David and try to kill him. And it ends in Saul's death. I mean, in the 31st chapter of 1 Samuel, Saul will die in a horrific way, and it all devolves. I mean, his pride just takes him all the way down this path. And I think that's the big picture of 1 Samuel. So the rest of 1 Samuel 19 through 31 is not covered by Come, Follow Me. And what we have in the 19th chapter is Saul telling his servants and Jonathan to kill David. And multiple times, David's life is threatened by Saul, but David escapes. And the next chapter, the 20th chapter, is this covenant between Jonathan and David. And it kind of is broken down into four parts. In the first part, they're covenanting in Jonathan's house as they're great friends. In the second part, they're in the open, and it deals with the planning. The third part, they're in Saul's house, we read. And in the fourth, they're in the open again, and it tells the execution of the plans. The plan is essentially this. Jonathan's an insider. He knows what's on his dad's mind, dad meaning Saul the king. And so he's going to try and send messages to David to protect him. And this chapter shows Saul being deceived by a member of his own family. So that's the 20th chapter. So if you get to the 21st chapter, David is going to get assistance from Ahimelech, the priest, and the sword of Goliath is kept at the sanctuary at Nob. Now, it doesn't say that in the chapter. You got to go to 1 Samuel 22, verse 9 to know that the sanctuary is at Nob. This uh, sword that's at the sanctuary is used as a trophy. Look in verse 9. The priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it. So the ephod, you remember, that's the breastplate of the high priest. So this is a holy article of the tabernacle. And the ephod, according to you know the best sources we have, 
contained the Urim and Thummim, these two stones, which were oracles, which were used to get answers from the Lord. And so there's a connection here between the sword of Goliath and the sword of Laban. You see the Nephite kings had the sword of Laban along with the Urim and Thummim, the Liahona, the plates of brass, and the other plates, and the breastplate. The Nephite articles of kingship paralleled in many ways the articles of kingship contained in the Ark of the Covenant in the Hebrew Bible. And we linked it in the show notes. We have a whole article on this. And so then we get to the 22nd chapter. The 22nd chapter of 1 Samuel is very difficult. We read this story that Saul is very upset when he finds out that the priest helped him. The priest helps David to escape the pursuers that are coming after him. And so Saul commands his Israelite soldiers to kill the priests that live at Nob, and they say, we're not going to do it. This is verse 17. The servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. They wouldn't do it. So who does? Doeg the Edomite. He does it, and he kills a bunch of them. And then it says that he kills the men and women and the oxen and all the the livestock. I mean, this is a very horrible chapter. It's very brutal. It's Saul killing the priests of the Lord. And you see how far he's fallen. I mean, it's like Laman in First Nephi. You get to see Laman fall and become this man that will that is willing to kill his father and his brother. And that fall is contrasted with Nephi's rise. And so you're kind of saying the same thing. You're going to see the goodness of David rising as Saul is now willing to kill priests who helped David. It's awful. Now we're going to get to 23, which is a foil to chapter 22. So Saul's downfall, and we get to see David's rise. And the shining star in this chapter is Jonathan. And we haven't talked a lot about Jonathan. And I hope as you read 1 Samuel, Jonathan will become a hero to you. Because the truth is, David was not really a threat to Saul. Saul's going to be king for the rest of his life. Saul never sees his kingdom taken away from him. But David is a threat to Jonathan because Jonathan is heir to the throne of Saul. Jonathan is Saul's son. And if anyone is threatened by David, it's Jonathan, because David is going to take Jonathan's kingdom away from him. So in chapter 23, we get to see David slays the Philistines. He continues his quest of goodness, his quest of of rising above the enemy and saving Israel from the Philistines. But the gem of chapter 23 is in verse 17. So Jonathan steps forward and says to David in verse, well, let me read verse 16. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Now, remember, this is the threat to your kingdom. If this man, David, is king, you, Jonathan, will never be king, but you are the king's son. Verse 17, he said unto him, fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. That is an incredible admission of, I support you, David. You're the right one. Now think about Saul disease and think about Jonathan. He says to David, who is the biggest threat to his glory, you're going to be king because you should be. You're a good king and I will support you. You see no anger from Jonathan toward David, but massive anger from Saul towards David. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that a great lesson in supporting others and loving them and being okay with who we are? And somehow Jonathan can rejoice in David's success, and it doesn't diminish his own. Jonathan doesn't butt himself. And that's why I love chapter 23. It kind of makes it sound like Jonathan would have been a great king. He would have been a fantastic king with that attitude. Yeah. So the next chapter, the 24th chapter, is David. He has an opportunity to kill Saul in a cave. He gets proof that he could have killed him. Saul's asleep, but he doesn't. And so this story is going to be repeated in a different way in another chapter. So there's a couple different traditions as far as this goes. But the general message of the 24th chapter is David could have killed Saul, but he doesn't. He doesn't, quote, raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. That's the general message. The 25th chapter is a great chapter. This is the story of Nabal and Abigail. Nabal and Abigail are married. 
and they live in a place where David sends servants. If you go to verse 8, the servants come and say in the King James, Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thine servants and to thy son David. Now, essentially what's going on is David's asking for assistance, or you could say he's extorting assistance. This man, Nabal, is very wealthy, and David needs food, and he needs goods. And the man's answer in verse 10 is, who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? It's kind of contemptuous. He's essentially saying, you know, you're not my king. I don't care about you. And Nabal's name is kind of fun. It means fool. And so the person who's going to save Nabal, because at this point, David's ready to kill him. In fact, three times in verse 13, it says that David is girding his sword. It seems to me from the reading of verse 13 that the author is trying to say Nabal's about to die. He's being disrespectful to David. And so his life is saved by Abigail. She brings food and drink to David's men, and she literally says, for as his name is, so is he. That's pretty fun. In other words, his name is Nabal. What would you expect? And so Nabal's life is saved, and Abigail brings a lot of support to David, and so she gives this beautiful, eloquent speech in the 24th to the 31st verse. And in this speech, she gives some really good advice to David. And at the conclusion of her speech, David blesses her, and there's a feast held in Nabal's house at the end of the chapter where Abigail tells Nabal that she helped David. That's in verse 37. And when Nabal finds out, verse 38 tells us that he dies. And after his death, David proposes marriage to Abigail, and the two are wedded. That's in 1 Samuel 25, 39 through 42. So David has married this woman who saved Nabal's life, but when she tells Nabal what happened, how she was able to support David, Nabal dies. Now, there's a lot of ways to read this. I think one of the ways to read this is Abigail is this woman who's kind of like the Savior. She stands between this horrible outcome and a fool, Nabal. In other words, I'm Nabal. I'm the dummy, right? I'm the guy that did the dumb thing. And Abigail fixes it, and she smooths it over. And I think the spirit of Abigail can be with all of us in our families. May we be peacemakers. May we be able to find ways to say, okay, Nabal, I know you're being kind of a knucklehead, and maybe you deserve some punishment, but I'm going to stand betwixt you in the punishment. She stands betwixt Nabal and David, and she fixes it. And it's really kind of beautiful, and it's right there in the middle of these kind of clunky chapters, because in the next chapter, the 26th chapter, we have a repeat of the cave story, except this time it's not a cave, but David has another opportunity to kill Saul, and he doesn't. Once again, he says, I can't do it because Saul is the Lord's anointed. I respect that position. I can't kill him, even though this is the man that's been hunting me, and he could claim self-defense here easily, but I won't do it. I won't slay him. Yeah. The 27th chapter is then David coming again to the Philistine king, Achish. And in this chapter, he comes and he stays with Achish at Gath as his vassal. And so David is paying tribute to Achish and he's among the Philistines. And this is setting up for the final confrontation between the Philistines and King Saul. And so then that's David. It's a really short chapter, this 27th chapter. It's just 12 verses. And then the author switches and we're not talking about David. Now we're talking about Saul. There's the foil. David is getting better and better and better, and Saul seems to be getting worse and worse. And now in chapter 28, he consults with a witch. He comes to this woman, this witch of Endor, and the reason why he's coming to her is because he can't get answers anymore. He's praying to God, and the Lord's not giving him answers. And so he goes to a woman with a familiar spirit. Now, there's some clunky stuff going on here in the King James, but the big picture of this story is is this woman who's this witch of Endor, however you're going to read the text, she conjures up Samuel. Samuel, who's passed away, he's conjured up. Now, Saul can't see him. So he says, well, what does he look like? That's verse 14. She says, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. So that's verse 14. So Samuel, the spirit of Samuel comes to him in verse 15 and says, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Or in other words, why have you troubled me? And Saul answers, I'm sore distressed for the Philistines make war against me and God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee that thou may 
mayest make known unto me what I shall do. And then this spirit that is Samuel gives him an answer. And the answer is essentially, you're going to lose. You're going to lose the kingdom, verse 17. The reason why is because you haven't obeyed God. That's verse 18. And then verse 19 says, the Lord is going to deliver the kingdom of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. He also says in verse 19, you and your sons are going to die and you're going to be with me. And verse 20 says that Saul fell straightway all along the earth and he was sore afraid. And then the rest of the chapter is this meal that he and this woman have. And this is all precipitating his battle with the Philistines. And there's a lot of different ways to interpret this. In the footnote in 14a of this chapter, it says, this cannot be a bona fide vision from God brought about by a spiritualist medium. Its effect was to destroy all hope. That's, I think, the Latter-day Saint position. Latter-day Saints read this and say, okay, we don't go to spiritualist mediums to conjure up the dead. I would advise anybody that I teach, if they say, hey, I want to go to this fortune teller, I would say, you know, that's not how we do it. I think the author of 1 Samuel is trying to present Saul has gone so far down the the wrong path that he's even making another bad choice. That all being said, I know that the scholarship out there isn't settled on this. And so there's another position that kind of says, well, there were mediums that could do this. And so we spell out some of those arguments in the show notes. I'm not going to get into it for this podcast other than to say this. I think this chapter is trying to show Saul going down the wrong road. I think that's the big picture of the 28th chapter. And so with that in mind, the 29th chapter, David's living in the Philistine land because he's being hunted by Saul, but he's also going on these sorties with the Philistines where they kind of sack some of their neighbors. The big group of the Philistine armies are now going against Israel, and they say, David, we don't want you with us. And so they're going to excuse him. And Achish is going to say, hey, you know what? You're not invited. You're you're not going to come with us on this attack of the Israelites. And so he doesn't. In the 30th chapter, it's called the sacking of Ziklag. Ziklag is this city that's David's temporary home among the Philistines. The Amalekites have sacked Ziklag. They have burned it down. And when David gets there, he's devastated because they've taken prisoners, including David's wives, Abigail and Ahinoam. They've been taken prisoner. And to make matters worse, in the sixth verse of 1 Samuel 30, many of the troops that are with David and their Philistines, they're considering killing David. You see, David's living in the Philistine land because he's being hunted by Saul. So David, going back to Ziklag, finds this place wrecked, and the Philistines are upset, and David's kind of a man in between. Is he Israelite? Is he Philistine? What do we do with this? And they're plotting his death. So David takes the ephod. And he inquires whether he should pursue the Amalekites. He asks the Lord in verse 8, should I go? And the Lord says, go. And so they go and they pursue the Amalekites and they find this Egyptian boy. And this Egyptian boy was kind of cast aside by the Amalekites and he's sick. And he says to them, I'll tell you where the Amalekites are if you guys promise to take care of me. And so they say, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And so then he shows them where the Amalekites are. David goes and he finds them. In chapter 30, verses 9 through 20, he defeats the Amalekites. He rescues the prisoners. This is kind of reminiscent of Abraham, how Abraham rescues people. And then he takes the spoils of war and he gives it to the men that helped him and even the men who don't help him. There's a group of men that won't help him and he he gives them the spoil and he even sends some of the spoils to the elders of Judah. I think what we're seeing here is David as a man who's not selfish, as a man who's not keeping all the stuff for himself, but he's distributing the spoils of war to everyone, even those that don't help. And then the final chapter of First Samuel is the death of Saul. We don't get a whole lot here other than that the Philistines attack, Saul is found dead, as well as Jonathan. And that is the end of Saul. That's the end of this tragic story of a wonderful man, a goodlier person you couldn't find among all of Israel, who got a little authority, and then we watched him fall because of it. And not only did he fail in liberating Israel, but at his death, the Philistines gained domination over most of the country. And if you remember from chapter 11, Saul's career began with the rescue of Jabesh Gilead, and it ends with the men of Jabesh Gilead going back and rescuing his body. You see, his body was defiled by the Philistines, and the men who were rescued early on in his reign 
go and they rescue his body and give him proper funeral rites. And I think that little detail is purposeful. I think the editor is trying to bookend Saul's life with something good that he did. He rescued a group of people who then rescue his defiled body and give it proper burial rites. So even in the midst of this really graphic and sometimes depressing chapter, there is a golden thread. And the golden thread is Saul did do some good, but it ends with Saul not doing the things that he could have done. And now we're going to watch the rise of the next king. As one falls, one rises. And David is being handed the baton. And so with that, we end this podcast. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.